EU has been uh, very key on the CTBT issues, uh, a great supporter. Uh, without the EU, I don't think we'll reach uh, the status of the verification regime, uh, the status of improvement, and then the support that uh, we have uh, all around. And uh, I was uh, two weeks ago, I think a week ago, at the European Leadership Network in London. I think it was EU again. And then I'm uh, engaging in bilateral discussion uh, this afternoon and tomorrow morning to try and further our cooperation with the EU. I mean, this is just to say how important the European Union is in supporting the CTBT and its verification regime. But Mark, uh, it's a good thing that you uh, have me today, only two months, uh, 60 days after I take office. And uh, it's been a, an hectic uh, two months. Uh, I don't think it's been as hectic uh, for the past two months than uh, what I've seen in the past nine years as director of IDC. But anyway, I'll try and hold my breath and then see how we, we move forward. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our contribution to the overall uh, non-proliferation regime, uh, talk about the status of the treaty, what we've engaged in uh, in the past uh, 17 years, and then uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned in the past two months, uh, what we've achieved, and then uh, where we're going. I'll also touch upon the improvement of the verification regime, because we've done quite a lot, uh, and I think it's uh, only fair that we mention to you where we stand, and then where we might be able to go. So. It's important indeed, uh, as I mentioned, to acknowledge uh, the countering, uh, the EU uh, countering the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction in the EU common foreign and security policy. This is the main priority. Uh, you've shown it. And then uh, the presence, and as you say, 50% more than last time, is a sign that uh, EU is getting stronger and stronger in the support to this uh, non-proliferation and disarmament issue. But EU is helping as well the developing world, and that's what is important, uh, because we cannot be uh, talking about uh, international peace and security, uh, we cannot be talking about disarmament and non-proliferation without having the buy-in of the developing world. And the EU has been key in uh, helping uh, the CTBT in building capacity in Africa, in the Pacific, and Latin America uh, for the developing world to buy into this treaty and understanding uh, how the CTBT is important, uh, not only in the framework of the verification regime, but also in its civil and scientific application. Because let's face it, uh, when I talk to people in Burkina Faso or in Niger, uh, the first question they ask me is, what are you doing in this organization? So what I'm doing it is in the organization is, uh, first of all, uh, participating in this international peace and security, but also seeing what kind of benefits the developing world can see in the treaty and the technology that we're using. And I think that has been key in getting the buy-in of the, the developing world, showing them that uh, this treaty and its technology are as important uh, to them as the first mandate, which is potentially monitoring nuclear tax explosion. And the civil and scientific uh, uh, technology, the civil and scientific use of our technology has been key in getting the developing world to buying into the treaty and then uh, adhering to uh, uh, signing and or ratifying uh, the CTBT. And you've seen recently with the ratification of Guinea-Bissau and Iraq, I think we still would, we seem to be uh, well on the way. The, the treaty and its unprecedented global and verification regime uh, demonstrate that uh, the multilaterally verifiable arms control uh, is possible and effective and necessary for advancing uh, the international peace and security. And that's what we've been trying uh, to do at the CTBT. The CTBT, not only that is banning the, uh, um, uh, banning the production of fissile material for military purpose, it provides a firm barrier against a qualitative and quantitative development of nuclear weapon for both nuclear weapon capable states and then would be possessors. The effective detection capability of our treaty uh, regime has been demonstrated in numerous occasions. Uh, we've often talked about the DPRK, but I would like to uh, touch upon the last one, the 2013 uh, test. Uh, that was an unusual situation because after 2006 and 2009, 
where we talk about uh, the detection capability of the, the, the verification regime. Uh, we've mentioned that uh, we're able to detect with the waveform technology. And then in 2009, people were a little bit uh, concerned uh, about the fact that the, the system didn't detect any sniff to give the technical specification to member states on the nuclear nature of the event. Uh, that was uh, perceived in some uh, uh, for us uh, uh, a downside of this verification regime. But what I often told people at the time was that the CTBT didn't detect, but no one else detects any sniff in 2009 with regard to the event in the Korean Peninsula. But 2013 was important because uh, not only that we had a lot of station due to the status of the verification system, the fact that we have, uh, we nearly, were nearly 85% completed. We, three weeks down the line, we told member states that uh, it would be difficult to detect any sniff that could be co uh, correlated to the, to the event in the Korean Peninsula. But one good thing was that 50 days down the line in uh, Japan, at one of our stations in Nagasaki, uh, we had a sniff of radionuclear detection. A sniff is good, but uh, the beauty was that we had two elements, two isotopes, uh, which could give us an indication of the potential fission that are produced the, the event, I mean the detection. So that was the two xenon that we had, and then by uh, mixing the ratio, we're able to see that the fission was probably 50 days, plus or minus three before, which fit with its detection in Japan 51 days later. And that was unusual, but the situation was a little bit tricky because if you detect this, what are the conditions to detect 50 days uh, xenon that will be correlated to a waveform, a waveform event uh, 50 days before? We don't have satellite means. The satellite means are national technical means. So there's only one scenario. The scenario is that either there's been a drilling at the site or somebody has probably opened the, the tunnel and then there was a path, and then that path has created the condition for the detection of the xenon. But we can't say this indeed because we don't have satellite means. So we had a, 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 an increased cooperation with not only uh, our member state, but some of the technical institutions that are involved with uh, scientific research with the CTBT through what we call our virtual data exploitation center. And then, we brief our member states, and then we try to be a little bit away from the media because, as you know, we're still provisional, even after or nearly 20 years down the line. And then I wanted to say that the provision nature of the CTBT is good to be said, but it's not good, in fact, when uh, you sit in a situation where you're not, you don't make available the data to the member state, they will not talk about the provisional nature of your organization. So it's good to say it because the treaty is not into force, but practically, we're not a provisional operation anymore because we're making available the data and the information to our member states within the 48 hours which are set for by the treaty when it enters into force. So what I would like to say here is that practically, the CTBT is functioning as a full-fledged organization. This is a reality. If we were not, we wouldn't be able to give you the information that you had in 2006, 2009, and 2013 to show you that the money that you're investing in this organization is not going into a hole, and this is key. What is happening is that the CTBT is effective, the organization is effective, your money is being used wisely, and then we're making sure that you feel that the money that you're giving to this organization, although the entry into force is uh, a little bit further away, the money is used wisely, and then we give, we're giving you a return in investment that meets your expectation and sometimes exceed, especially with regard to the three uh, GPRK. But let me touch upon, when I say the three GPRK, let me mention as well uh, the civil and scientific application during Fukushima. There was a lot of noise during Fukushima and then that was a little bit of a question where we stand between the IEA and the CTBT. Our role is not to walk on the toes of the IEA. Our role is to complement the IEA where needed and when needed. And I've been very uh, firm on this and uh, in my uh, recent discussion with uh, Amano, this is what I said, we're there to give the IEA what they need from the CTBT. We're there to make sure that your money 
is invest properly so that you don't duplicate what you have in the CTBT already, you don't duplicate it by creating it in the IEA. And that was one of the questions that I was talking about with regard to waveform technology. We are able to give the waveform technology information and the radionuclide information globally to the IEA for their use, but we will only step in if they need it. And this is important. With Fukushima, we've shown that we are the only globally capable institution that could give you the framework necessary for you to follow up the dispersion of radioisotope around the globe. So now, uh, the universality status of the treaty. Uh, we are now 183, 161 ratifications since uh, uh, last week. Uh, this is mean that the treaty is universal. It is universal. We only have this, uh, uh, I had Ambassador Shazukan and Ambassador Hoffman uh, this week, early this week in, uh, in, uh, in New York, uh, no, last week in New York, when they were telling us that they are the reason for this treaty not being into force because in the negotiation, they're the one who were discussing the provision of the Annex II, which is making the entry into force difficult for this treaty. But I'll come to that later. I have them as part of a group of eminent persons that I've initiated, and then I've told them if the reason is you now, you have a room to make the treaty, to help make this treaty into force. And that's the task that I'm giving them with some of you, and then I'll come to that uh, uh, shortly. The status of the treaty, uh, let me talk about a few changes. I think we see positive sign from China. I've uh, uh, visited China as my first trip uh, when I took office. Uh, I was amazed by the positive sign and uh, the informal way the foreign minister has had the discussion with me on how China is committed to this treaty. And as a sign of their commitment for the past nearly 10 years, we've been negotiating with China data provision to the International Data Center. And it took the last 10 minutes of our discussion with the Vice Minister of Defense to get them to agree that uh, they would accept to provide data to the International Data Center, and hence improving again our detection capabilities. Not only this, uh, one also positive sign was that the Foreign Minister mentioned to me that to have Ambassador Shazukan as part of uh, the group of eminent person that uh, I initiated, uh, he had to get clearance from the Congress. I was uh, pleased a week down the line when he called and sent a message to say that Ambassador Shazukan could be part of this uh, group of eminent person. So having someone from an Annex II country that hasn't ratified the treaty, being part of a group that is there to promote the entry into force of the treaty is indeed a positive sign. It's a positive sign politically, which is materialized technically by them allowing all the station operators of China and the National Data Center expert to come to Vienna and then discuss the framework for the data provision, which hasn't been done for the past 10 years. And this is much appreciated. I've engaged as well in discussion with the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran in New York recently, and then uh, talked about uh, China's movement and the positive turn from, uh, from China. We're trying to get Iran to connect their station because there is a station that is certifying in, our, in Iran for them to be able to build the trust that is needed in their neighboring to get people to buy into the fact that Iran is uh, truly only caring about the peaceful use of nuclear energy. I think starting by connecting their station and making that perceived gap in the Middle East in terms of the coverage and the detection capability will be a good and an important step forward. And this is what I've discussed with the Deputy Foreign Minister, and then I'm yet to be invited in Iran to discuss the framework and then how to, to see the connection. The good thing was that he was very blunt. Uh, he told me, look, it was all about trust. Uh, they've had issues in the negotiation uh, in the IEA, an issue that I've, uh, impacted their relationship with the CTBT, but what he said, uh, which maybe uh, I'm allowing myself to mention, he said, is seeing somebody from the developing world heading this organization, and then starting a discussion that will uh, recreate that trust that has not been uh, damaged, uh, could help uh, move forward. So I'm uh, hopeful that with Iran, we'll be able to, to, to get things going, at least technically for the station, and then hopefully have the technical framework 
inject some energy in the political framework for us to move uh, 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 the way down. Another thing was Israel. Israel, uh, I've been, uh, uh, I've visited Israel several times. I've had a discussion with the Director General of uh, Atomic Energy a couple of weeks ago in Vienna. Uh, the good thing is that Israel did mention that um, it's the first time in 12 years that they're facing a situation where the CTBT issue is even brought into discussion with Parliament. It's not talking about the ratification of the CTBT, but at least the fact that they can even discuss this issue in Parliament is a positive sign. So now, uh, Korea. Korea is another issue. I've been asked uh, several times if we will engage in discussion with North Korea. Of course, yes. No country is to be ignored in our framework for getting this treaty into force. I'll be ready with your help, with the help of the group of eminent persons that I've initiated, which is uh, a, a group of uh, former prime minister, former secretary of defense, former foreign ministers, Ambassador Abe, former Under Secretary for Disarmament, is part of the group. It's a group that I would like to have assisting the CTBT because we've reached, let's face it, we've reached our level, our limit, in terms of uh, getting further ratification in the annexed two countries. We've done the treaty as universal as possible, but the eight remaining countries have their own national and own domestic issue that are beyond what the Provisional Technical Secretariat can do. And it's only fair that we get people who have the credential, the credibility, the experience, the wisdom, the contact necessary at high level to help us move forward, to help us establish the contact that will uh, lead us into succeeding at least one or two ratification in the eight remaining. I want to quote Hans Blix, who was telling me uh, last week that, uh, and uh, Ambassador Habe uh, will confess, that uh, uh, he would like to work on a framework where you have collective ratification. I mean, this is our, our dream. Uh, I would like to be able to count on uh, Hans Blick's wisdom uh, to help us move forward. But at least if we even have four collective ratification, it will set the tone for the remaining one. What I would like to say, since the red is blinking already, I know you say that I'm flexible, but I want to say that you cannot imagine how blessed I feel to be part of this endeavor. How blessed and privileged I am to lead this organization and then dream of its entry into force with your support, because your support is key. Europe is 100% behind this treaty. Europe is a driving force of this treaty. I want all of you, I want to be able to count on your support. Your support will help the wealth of expertise that we have at the CTBT. I invite you to come and visit our infrastructure to come and meet the expert that we have, the young and experienced staff that are working day in and day out to get this treaty into force. I thank you.